Welcome back to Seeker Strength and welcome back to Seeker Psychology. Now, this video came about through this leaked clip. You always just do that. I guess, uh, but you get the fucking penalty of us. And you promise you won't. You promise you're going to screw up it. You promise you're going to play like the last fucking game as a group together. But you lie. You're a fucking liar. Now, what are we seeing here? Well, it's halftime in the World Cup semi-final. They're 12-6 down to an underdog English side. We see Razi Erasmus, who's arguably the best coach in the world at the time, pulling his players apart. So the best team who currently exist, and arguably, on the standards of world rugby and how the game has changed, the best team to have ever existed. He's calling them liars. He says they've lied to him, they've lied to their teammates, lied to their wives. You promised you would. You promised you'd scrum there. You promised you'd play out your last game together, but you won't. You lied. Now, these are hard words. These are words that are not without consequence, emotional words. These players will be playing for him again. So what's happening here? And how is this what repeatedly gets results out of athletes? Well, there's a decent block of literature around emotional control of athletes. And there are some frameworks that we can use in our everyday training and competing to help us out here. The first one of these is individual zones of optimum functioning. So it's IZOF, developed by a guy called Yuri Hannon. It's a prominent framework in sports psychology that focuses on understanding and optimizing athletes' emotional experiences to enhance their performance. This emphasizes the individual nature of optimal emotional states, recognizing that what works best for one athlete or team may not be effective for another athlete. It posits that athletes have specific zones of emotional intensity where they perform at their peak and deviations from these optimal zones can impact performance mostly negatively. The model categorizes emotional experiences into functional and dysfunctional categories based on their impact on performance. So functional emotions, whether pleasant or unpleasant, are those that enhance performance by providing motivation, focus or energy. In contrast, dysfunctional emotions hinder performance by causing distractions, anxiety or over arousal. Through techniques such as individualized emotional profiling and regulation strategies tailored to each of the athlete's unique profile, the IZOF model aims to help athletes achieve and maintain their optimal emotional states for peak performance, time in and time out. So let's dig a little deeper into Razzie's rant. What's going on here? How can we classify this, whether it be functional or dysfunctional, pleasant or unpleasant? And firstly, I think we can all agree it's functional. The Saffords went out, got stuck into the English, won the semi-final and eventually won the World Cup. So Razzie is having a functional impact here. But could we classify it as positive? Well, doubtful. It's probably best classified as functional unpleasant zone. And don't worry, I can hear you shouting, what in God's name is going on here? So here's what's happening. Functional pleasant, or the functional pleasant zone, are emotional experiences that contribute positively to an athlete's performance. For example, feelings of confidence and motivation or excitement can fall into this category. Functional pleasant emotions enhance performance by energizing athletes and facilitating effective execution of tasks, like giving a player a slap on the back after they've done well, or giving a young player a few words of encouragement to keep his head up. It's funny that the, probably if one of the youngest guys in the team, Owen Farrell, is the guy that's driving everyone on, though. You know, we all need to add that extra bit to our game, lads, and become a team, push each other around the corner all the time, push each other to get off the ground. Every little thing we do, the guy is 22 years of age, barking at everyone, driving everyone around the pitch, we should all be doing it. Here we see Paul O'Connell giving some feedback, undoubtedly, in the functional pleasant zone for a young Owen Farrell, but functionally unpleasant for almost everyone else. So functional unpleasant, on the other hand, means that despite being unpleasant, these emotional experiences serve a functional purpose in enhancing the performance. It's calling those players liars. Examples also include feelings of anxiety or nervousness pre-competition. While these emotions may be uncomfortable, they can motivate athletes to focus and perform at their best. Thus, contributing to the overall success. 
So here's Andy Farrell, Owen's father, throwing a little dummy and landing a functionally unpleasant prompt in amongst the Lions players. Last weekend, good effort. Good effort as far as D's concerned. A lot of pressure coming on us, especially on our own line. And they kept pounding away and pounding away. And it was a gallant effort, boys. Right? That's what I would say to you if I was your club coach or if I was your international coach, but I'm not. We're your Lions coaches. And a gallant effort, good defence, or good spirit ain't good enough at this level. You can see it, right? A plain and simple kick up the hole. So he says... That's what I'd say to you if you were a, if I were your club coach or international coach, but I'm not. I'm your Lions coach. So he's showing appreciation of talent, but it's still demanding more from them and ensuring that they understand they're not doing a good enough job. Moving on then to the dysfunctional. So dysfunctional, pleasant. These are experiences that, despite being pleasant, hinder your performance. Examples may include overconfidence or complacency, which can lead to a lack of effort or a lack of focus during training or competition. While these emotions may feel good in the moment, they ultimately detract from optimal performance outcomes. This is the eating an extra slice of cake before training and gaining weight over time. It feels great, but it's not good. Another example would be constantly maxing out so you can put the video on Instagram or get that hit of dopamine, but you're never doing volume work and thus stunting your long-term progress. These are the kind of emotions we're talking about. You know full well that when you arrive home, getting a well done from your mom doesn't mean anything if you've lost another game or become re-injured. It's nice to hear, but it doesn't mean anything. It's pretty much useless. Dysfunctional unpleasant then is the last one. These emotional experiences are both unpleasant and detrimental to performance. If someone's walking, if someone isn't filling the gap, you get on his case, you say it to him. If I fucking walk and I want to hear it, listen to me now, listen to me. I want them standing back thinking what the fuck is going on here. Not for the first five minutes, every fucking minute of the game. Fucking manic aggression. Did you scare anyone? Did you fucking put the fear of God into anyone? So you might look at that and say, wait, it's a great speech. I've listened to that before every game for the past five years. But we're not talking about that context. What happens if you're already shitting yourself? If Paulie's your under-12s coach and you are already on the fence as to if you were up for a game or not, I think you can see what I mean. Another example would be feelings of fear, frustration, or anger that interfere with an athlete's ability to execute skills effectively. Dysfunctional, unpleasant emotions drain energy, disrupt concentration, leading to suboptimal performance outcomes and possibly choking. So I've been running a lot, right? Most days, it's not always hard runs. I'm only two months into a seven-month block. It's a bit of a slog, right? It's not all sunshine and rainbows. I've worked in sport for a long time and there's ways of getting around this discomfort. There are ways of shutting up that little voice in your head, like having well-planned structures so you can't just change a session round, like increasing sleep, incentivization of effort, stimulants like caffeine and nicotine or others, new running gear or equipment that makes it feel good. They all help, right? Yeah, definitely, they do. But none of them help quite as much as if you were to tell me somebody was breaking into my house and I was a mile from home. I can guarantee you, you'd see some pretty fast mile times then. Or if I was suddenly transported to a world where instead of doing track repeats on a Wednesday afternoon, I was back playing ball and had a 100 meter sprint to the try line. That 14th or 15th sprint of the day would probably be the fastest and would undoubtedly be more enjoyable than all the other repeats I'd do on any other Wednesday afternoon. What we're playing with here is emotional regulation, and I look at it like the volume switch in your brain. Emotions are integral to human experience, particularly in the realms of sport, and in this context, emotions wield significant influence over athletes, affecting their focus, decision-making, pain tolerance, and overall performance outcomes. Functional emotions can help athletes adapt optimally to situational demands, while dysfunctional ones can hinder performance. 
central to navigating this emotional landscape is the concept of emotional regulation. Being able to reach up and turn that volume switch up or down, it's the ability to manage and modulate one's emotional experiences effectively. In the sporting arena, emotional regulation emerges as a critical skill for athletes who are striving to perform consistently. And so the aim of every coach and athlete should be to delve into the intricate relationship between emotional regulation and athletic performance. So is it more hyped up, more better, or is it more calm, more better? And how those factors influence their own or their athletes' performances. The nuances of emotional self-regulation within the context of sport can and should be simplified and parsed out. Firstly, we should examine how athletes navigate their emotional states to achieve peak performance. Then, from the terminology surrounding emotion self-regulation all the way to the practical strategies athletes employ, let's look at these frameworks and theories that underpin this crucial aspect of athletic excellence. My real aim for this is for you to get an understanding for your own emotion regulation in sport or whatever it is you're trying to perform highly in. I know I mentioned individualized emotional profiling earlier, but this can start off as simply as a training journal. Snatches felt good, clean and jerks were tripe, I couldn't get my head in the game, etc. Small notes documenting our process. So then, there's a framework, right? It's called a process model of emotion regulation, and you guessed it, it's a process of steps that you go through each time. The first one is situation selection. Now, here we talk about choosing or avoiding activities based on their emotional impact. And we don't often think about situational avoidance or situational confrontation in sport, but there are hundreds of times in every competition, like what lifts you're going to select, what your opener will be, or maybe what plays you're going to select when you're playing a field sport. For example, Opting not to kick for the posts if it's right on the edge of your kicker's range so as to keep their confidence high for later kicks. Nearly everything here comes down to that clash of avoidance versus confrontation. If you're arguing with a player on the field, do you lean in and grab them for a chat or do you avoid them because you know it's going to push you over the edge emotionally? Next up then is situation modification. So altering the features of a situation to change its emotional effect. This could involve seeking support from a coach to fix a technical error that you were worried about as you go to your next competition, or reaching out to a teammate and trying to resolve conflicts. Attentional deployment then is the third one, and this is directing your attention to increase or decrease specific emotions. Techniques like imagery can of course enhance performance, Obviously, team talks and those psycho periods before a game will do the same thing. And this is where a lot of our heavy metal music or stimulants or these emotional periods will start to be leveraged. Cognitive change then is the next step. So it's modifying the meaning of a situation to change your feelings about it. For instance, during the Andy Farrell clip, when he praises them for having good defense, if it was a club or international team, Players could ruminate or focus on that and use it as a scaffolding for emotional distress they may be having. It's the ability to pick and choose and construct a psyche for a specific performance outcome. Finally then on the process is response modulation. So it works on you adjusting the experiential, physiological or expressive components of the emotional response. And this is athletes using techniques like breathing exercises to calm their heart rate or putting in behavioral quirks in their their pre-performance routines to regulate arousal levels and enhance performance. It's the small tweaks here and there to make sure the outcomes of the stress, so increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, maybe sweating, to modulate those outcomes. Now, the process model of emotion regulation is not the only horse in this race, and a model which aligns quite well to it, but squares the circle in a different approach, is mindfulness for emotional regulation. Mindfulness in sport entails directing sustained attention to a present moment or experience without judgment, offering athletes a powerful tool for emotional regulation. By cultivating non-judgmental awareness, mindfulness helps athletes to manage their emotional responses effectively during high-pressure situations. 
Rather than trying to control or suppress emotions, mindfulness encourages athletes to accept and tolerate their internal experiences and foster a healthy relationship with their emotions and the outcomes of those emotions. This approach aligns with the process model of emotion regulation, emphasizing the adaptive capacity to sustain and tolerate emotions for optimal performance. And this shows how important the adaptability side of that is. In sport, mindfulness practice enables athletes to acknowledge and tolerate their emotional state without allowing it to interfere with their focus or their performance. This acceptance not only reduces emotional reactivity, but also enhances athletes' ability to maintain task-relevant attention and make effective decisions under pressure. Moreover, mindfulness encourages athletes to view their thoughts as transient events, freeing them up from the grip of negative or distracting thoughts that can hinder performance repeatedly. Ultimately, by promoting experience tolerance and acceptance, mindfulness empowers athletes to navigate their emotional landscape with greater resilience and composure, leading to improved performance outcomes on the field or the platform or the court. I hope you've enjoyed today's video. If you have a topic you'd like to hear covered on Seek a Psychology, then please let me know in the comments. As always, we're massively appreciative of everybody who watches, listens, interacts with the videos, and we'll talk to you all again soon.